All right, thanks. Yeah, so I'm Dan, this is Grant, and we work at a company called Bug Crowd. And in case you haven't heard of us, we help connect the cybersecurity community with the cybersecurity marketplace uh, so we can help you find bugs before the bad guys do. So today we're here to talk to you about how to run a successful bug bounty program. Uh, we have set up many bug bounty programs, and we have had a lot of things we've learned along the way, um, all kinds of you know things we've seen that were good, things that were bad, uh, and so we want to share some of that with you so you can potentially consider starting one yourself. Uh, so first, I'm going to hand it over to Grant to introduce himself. Hi. Uh, so uh, my name is Grant. Um, my voice is kind of going out at the moment, but I think we should be good to go through this. Um, so currently, I'm a solutions architect at Bug Crowd, uh, which means I help set up uh, bug bounty programs and, and help through the onboarding process to create successful bug bounty programs. Uh, formerly, I was also an application security engineer, also at Bug Crowd, which means I validated vulnerabilities that came in to the bug bounty programs that we manage. So I have the unique perspective of being on both sides of uh, you know the field in terms of both setting up a program and also helping manage that program. Uh, before Bug Crowd, I spent a few years at White Hat Security, also as an application se security engineer, uh, and I enjoy traveling, making music, and uh, stuff. And I'm Dan. I'm currently a senior application security engineer, so I work on submissions. I also work on all kinds of operational processes. I work with people like Grant, who set up bounties, to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Before that, I worked in software security at HP, specifically on the Fortify product, so this was a lot more uh, white box than what I'm doing now, uh, but still a lot of the stuff applies, and it's, it's been very interesting. And I ended up focusing on iOS, so I still have a particular love of mobile and of other kinds of device type testing. And my free time, I actually like to learn about and collect art. So bug bounty programs. How many of you are familiar with bug bounty programs? Okay, yeah, there's a few of you. It's AppSec, so that's, that's good. Uh, what you might not be aware of is that bug bounty programs actually started a while ago. So uh, Netscape ran the first bug bounty program in 1995 on the 2.0 version of their Navigator browser. And this is something where one of the engineers realized that there are a whole bunch of their really hardcore fans and users that were actually finding bugs and reporting them and even sometimes helping fix these bugs. And he said, wait a second, we should actually make this a thing. We should get this to be a formal thing. So they did, and it worked very well. Uh, so this is actually the original announcement from Web Archive uh, from actually 21 years ago as of Monday. Uh, additionally, since then, bug bounty programs have really taken off. So you can see that you know, there were some really, really early ones um, like Netscape. And then, of course, there was you know, Google and Facebook around 2010, 2011. And then since then, we've seen an interesting trend, which is that a lot of companies that are a little bit more traditional actually are starting bug bounty programs. So we have automat automotive manufacturers like Tesla, Fiat Chrysler, uh, Financial Services, uh, Western Union, MasterCard, just a lot of companies that are typically more conservative when it comes to security. They're actually using bug bounty programs, and they're doing so very effectively. Well, why would you want to start a bug bounty program? At first, you might be thinking, well, we don't want to just go out there and tell the world, let's you know, come hack me and we'll pay you money. That seems very, very scary. Uh, but actually, if you went to uh, Casey and Jim's talk yesterday, you know that they're already out there. So actually running a bug bounty program, especially uh, doing some interesting things like running a private program, can let you actually manage the risk of these people that are already out there. You're actually giving them a way to disclose vulnerabilities in a responsible way, and usually incentivizing uh, you know, good behavior in order to do so. So this gets into the main theme of a bug bounty program, which is this is you and them. It's not you versus them. Uh, you have to get the notion out of your head that you're working against these people around the world. Uh, you have to think of them as an extension of your team, essentially. Um, these are people who are really they do want to help you. And in working with them, you're going to establish the kind of relationship that's going to allow you to uh, have them test in the future. And that will help a lot uh, down the road. So who are these people? Uh, they really kind of are everyone. Uh, so this is actually a heat map that shows uh, among our users where you know where these people are from, and you can see they are from all over the world. Um, but this extends to all other areas of diversity. So we have people of all ages. Uh, we have you know a lot of younger people, but of course we have people that are not necessarily as young. We have people who have been in AppSec for many many years, or have been in other areas for many years, and we have people who are just learning security for the first time that are all doing this. Uh, they do have all levels of experience, as I mentioned. You know, you could be they could be appsec people, could be pen testers by day, and do this kind of as a moonlighting thing. But we really even get people who are just trying to use this as a way to learn security. 
Uh, they're also they're use, your users and non-users, and this might be uh, kind of an interesting thing to think about, which is that perspective-wise, you have people who actually have a vested interest in making your app better because they use it all the time. Uh, they feel like if you improve things, then it's going to make their life easier and make them feel better. Uh, additionally, you have people who are not your users who might just want the challenge, and they test on all their programs, and they're going to come to your program just because it's there and they're offering money for bugs, and uh, it'll you know it's a different perspective. And that's that's very valuable. Overall, these people are passionate about security, and that's the common denominator, and that's where, uh, when you work with them, you're going to see a lot of value. So the value of crowdsource testing really does come in because of this diversity. When you have a whole group of people who are from different backgrounds, different levels of experience, different ages, uh, they've seen different things in life, and this is just the kind of thing that's going to lead to a very interesting result that you don't get with traditional testing. That's not to say that they don't use traditional methods or methodologies, so you do have this idea of a series of steps, you know, kind of uh, reconnaissance, enumeration, exploitation, documentation, a lot of things you would see with a normal pen test, but the difference is with a giant crowd of people, you can actually have them focus on individual areas such that the sum of the whole is actually far more powerful than just having one or two people using a formal methodology. So how do you go about doing this? That's what we're going to talk to you about. Uh, to give you a little bit of an outline, we're going to start with a lot of the pre-launch aspects. And this is kind of Grant's territory. He's going to talk about uh, some of the things you need to consider when you're setting up a program. Stuff like, where do you want them to test? What, what's the scope? Uh, what kind of things do you want them to focus on? This could be vulnerability types. This could be particular targets, particular target types, anything like that. Then you're, need, you're going to need to specify your exclusions as well. This is very important to make sure that you don't, you know, you, you say up front what you don't want to see. And then uh, setting up the environment and access to the environment is a very important part because you want it to be as easy uh, as possible so there's very good experience for the person testing and there's not a lot of roadblocks to kind of make them discourage and go somewhere else. Now, I didn't really mention paying rewards. Well, uh, we generally advise paying cash at BugCrowd. It tends to be a pretty good motivator. Uh, this is actually a distribution across uh, unique paid submitters of uh, how much money they got. And this is, you can see, a pretty big chunk of people got a lot of money from bug bounties. Uh, and this is the kind of thing where, you know, the cash is going to be a very good motivator. Additionally, I don't know if anyone here has tried to ship a t-shirt to Egypt, but it's very hard. There's a lot of logistics. It's very expensive. Uh, it's just a very bad experience, and it's much better, honestly. Instead of swag, it's just to a, a reward a nominal amount of money. Um, researchers would like it more, and it would just be easier for you. Uh, so before we get into some of the pre-launch stuff, I want to bring up kind of a very important uh, golden rule that we like to think about, which is the boundary between where you do and don't pay for bugs. So if you touch the code, you should pay for the bug. Um, this seems very simple, but, and of course, this is only security bugs, not, you know, UI bugs or non-security bugs, but if a bug has tangible security impact and you actually are making a change as a result of the report, you got value from the researcher, and that's a very important distinction. You should use that as a rough guideline for where you do and don't pay, because um, you, won't, you won't pay for everything. Some things are accepted risks, but just keep this in mind. So now I'm going to hand it over to Grant to talk about the pre-launch. Cool. Thanks, Tan. All right, so... Um, First, uh, so what we're going to be doing here in the pre-launch uh, section is we're going to be talking about setting up what we're going to call the bug bounty brief. Uh, this is typically a single page document that contains all the information uh, that researchers are going to need to test on your program. It's going to provide them with the scope, the focus areas, exclusions, things that Dan already touched on and that we'll go into more detail in a moment. Um, and I just want to preface all this information with these are real things that we've learned uh, from launching a number of bug bounty programs. Uh, so these are, these are real questions and, and hopefully tips that you're able to get some value out of as well. Uh, so before we go anywhere, uh, let's take a step back and talk about step zero. Uh, do you have the basic resources and requirements to run a bug bounty program? At the bare minimum, that looks like uh, at least one security professional who can dedicate a substantial portion of time towards managing this program. Ideally, this isn't going to be someone that, you know, you don't tack this on to someone's already heavy workload. If you don't have this person, you may need to either hire them or, you know, hire a third party to manage your program for you. Um, other things to consider in, in, before setting up your program are escalation policies. Uh, what happens once the first critical vulnerability comes in? Uh, so you get a SQL injection vulnerability. How does that first, like, what's the, how is that escalated? And then also, how is that remediated within a timely manner? Uh, these are also th things to consider prior to launching. And also, 
Uh, take into consideration how this affects other elements of your organization. Uh, typically, a bug bounty program is rarely isolated to just the security team. Uh, it, it often affects also your, your PR, your marketing teams. Uh, obviously, it affects developers. It affects uh, program owners and people like that. So making sure that everybody is on the same page when you're going forward and creating this program. So now we're going to start building uh, this bounty brief, this single page document. Now, the single most important thing when building this document is the scope. The scope is, is what tells researchers what they're going to test. Um, so there's three things that we've come up with in terms of uh, to take into consideration when create, that'll help you create a good scope. Uh, so the first thing is leave nothing open to interpretation. So let's say we have the example of myapp.com forward slash app. And we say, OK, this is the scope that we want everybody to test against. Now, if we take a step back and we look at it from a researcher perspective, if I'm a researcher and I look at that, am I only allowed to test on forward slash app? Or do I test all of myapp.com as well? Uh, and in either case, I'm either testing too little or possibly too much. So making sure that that possibly can't or can't possibly be misunderstood by researchers is incredibly important in creating a good scope. Um, in line with that, Understanding the attack surface is also important. So if we go back to the my app example, so we have myapp.com uh, and, and we say, okay, we're going to just cut off the forward slash app and we're just going to say myapp.com. Uh, as a researcher, when I go to start testing on your application, I log into login.myapp, um, you know, the accounts are at accounts.myapp, API is api.myapp, and there's all these other subdomains. And again, you're stuck in the position of, okay, do I test on these or can I not test on these? Um, and you know, so taking these things into consideration when building your scope uh, is incredibly important. So spider your application, understand your application, and all the different subdomains that need to be in scope for researchers to be successful in testing on your program. Now, you could also go in the other direction, right? So that's having too narrow of a scope. Uh, we could also have too large of a scope. So you may say, okay, so, you know, uh, we want to include all the subdomains, which is great. So we'll do like star dot domain, and all the subdomains are in scope. Um, this is great. From a researcher perspective, it's really fun to test on a star dot domain. I don't know if you've ever had that as a scope or, or tested as a researcher, but you can often find, you know, weird subdomains that, you know, have, you know, a lot of vulnerabilities that aren't part of the main application. Um, but for the very same reason, this is great for the, from the researcher perspective. This may not be so great from your perspective because you may end up paying for bugs that, while important, uh, these may not be the things that you wanted to focus on. You may have your focus on, you know, my app and, you know, people are finding, you know, these, these vulnerabilities on a, you know, a weird staging server. Um, and they're good vulnerabilities. But again, understanding your application and knowing, uh, all the different subdomains that are available for researchers to test on, uh, and then building around that. Um, so Dan's going to talk a little bit later about, uh, you know, using researcher tools, like how researchers are actually going to go about, like, finding these subdomains are also other ways you can take into account when, when uh, finding and understanding your attack surface. Finally, I recognize that researchers, like any other force of nature, are going to follow the path of least resistance, right? So if we set up uh, an iOS application and a web application, the vast majority of researchers are going to tend to focus on the web application. Um, so that takes us into uh, focus areas. So uh, the researchers aren't going to know that, you know, if 80% of your traffic goes through your mobile application and only 20% goes through your web app, uh, researchers aren't going to know this information. So that's stuff that you want to call out to researchers. That's stuff that you need to make sure that they're aware of. Uh, and we call these focus areas. So you might want to focus on certain targets. Uh, other things may be vulnerability types. Maybe you just deployed a new XSS filter or something to that capacity and you want to see if researchers can break that. Call that out to researchers and make sure that, you know, they know what you want them to test. Um, additionally, functionality is also another thing that we see a lot of. So if you just deployed new code to your application or there's a new functionality that you want them to test on, again, most researchers aren't going to know that that's what you want, you know, tested. So call it out to researchers. And again, as a researcher, um, this information is incredibly beneficial as well because that's the freshest code, the most likely to have vulnerabilities. And uh, so both parties can potentially benefit from this. So um, in terms of, you know, how do we get people to test on these areas that we want people to focus on? Uh, incentives. Uh, you know, uh, Dan talked about it earlier. Rewards are ultimately the way that you're going to get people to, you know, do things that you want. 
Um, so, you know, attach bonuses or multipliers to, you know, certain target types. So test vulnerabilities on, you know, the mobile app are rewarded at a higher rate than those on the web application. Or, you know, uh, if you're able to, you know, compromise, you know, this XSS filter, we'll give you a lump sum. Now, just as important as talking about the focus areas or the things that you do want researchers to test on, it's equally important that we call out what we don't want researchers to test on. And the reason this is incredibly important is because if, if we put ourselves in the researcher's shoes, uh, if we don't tell researchers what we don't want to find, researchers are going to submit everything. And then, you know, the researchers spend time writing up those reports, and then you have to spend time evaluating those reports and then interacting with the researchers. Um, so you really want to, as, as much as you can call out the areas that you know you researchers are typical to you know uh, submit and and uh, you know say hey you know don't submit these things so things that you might not care about um, and this is not an exhaustive list by any means uh, but these are some things to, to start thinking about when building your list of exclusions um, so low impact low hanging fruit uh, is a really common one uh, the poster child for this is typically click jacking um, do you care about click checking or do you not care about click checking? In either sense, uh, make sure you call that out to researchers um, so that, you know, they're not submitting click checking if that's something that you don't want to see. Or maybe be a little more specific and say, hey, only click checking uh, with a proof of concept on a sensitive function. And so that, that, that points to researchers in the right directions and, and they only create reports or, you know, if they have a click checking report, it has to have a proof of concept and it has to be demonstrated on a sensitive functionality. Um, other things to consider are intended functionality. This often looks like um, anything that could be misconstrued, like say an HTML editor, right? So a uh, uh, researcher is going to, you know, inject in the HTML editor somewhere that injection is going to fire, uh, and, and they may consider that cross-site scripting. Uh, so take these things into account and call that out and say, hey, you know, there's an HTML editor. It's that's intended functionality. That's not cross-site scripting. Um, other things to think about are known issues. This is a really uh, sort of gray area. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, ideally most of your issues are fixed before you, you know, launch your program. But realistically, that's not plausible. Um, so you want to, as much as you can, let researchers know about these issues. Um, and the reason for this is if we, again, put ourselves in the researcher's shoes, um, think about if you spend a couple hours testing against an application and then you find a pretty cool vulnerability and then you submit this vulnerability and, and you get a response back that says, hey, this is something that we found via a pen test a couple months ago. In, from that perspective, like how much more are you willing to invest in testing this application? Uh, you know, what else was found on that pen test from a couple months ago? And you could potentially spend, you know, an infinite number of hours uh, and, and not get rewarded for anything. So calling these issues out ahead of time to researchers is incredibly beneficial. And it doesn't have to be ver verbose. You don't have to say, oh, you know, like all the nitty gritty details about the vulnerabilities. But, you know, hey, by the way, we have, you know, this form is vulnerable to CSERF. Like, please don't submit that. Um, stuff like that goes a long way in showing the researchers that you really care about this program and you don't want them to waste their time submitting vulnerabilities uh, that, that won't get them paid. Um, other things to consider are accepted risks. Uh, the most common example of this is open redirects. Sometimes open redirects are simply just part of your model um, or how your business works. Uh, you know, it's Yes, it's, a, it's part of the OWASP top 10. So, you know, most researchers are going to say that, hey, this is a valid vulnerability. Uh, I should get compensated for this. And then you say, oh, wait, you know, this is part of our model. If you can, you know, get out in front of that and you can tell researchers ahead of time that, hey, please just don't submit open redirects. You don't have to go through that discussion. Um, and then finally, uh, do you want to uh, reward issues uh, based on pivoting? Um, so say we have SQL injection. From that SQL injection, you're able to find that, you know, your passwords are insecurely hashed. Uh, that you can find some really cool things from that, that second layer finding, but do you want researchers to go that far? Uh, letting researchers know how far to go or where to stop uh, is also incredibly important for researchers so that they don't invest extra time in testing against this application or trying to find additional vulnerabilities um, you know, that you may not intend to reward for. So if you do or don't uh, intend to reward uh, you know, second layer issues, uh, make sure that you, you know, tell researchers, you know, hey, stop as soon as you get, you know, the database version number. Or maybe go as far as you can and show us everything. Uh, so those are some of the things to consider when building, uh, you know, your list of exclusions. 
Uh, so in terms, so now we're, we've, we've got, you know, the things we care about, we've got our scope, uh, we've told people what not to submit. Uh, now what, what are they going to be testing on, right? So there's typically two options here. You have production and you have staging. Uh, whenever possible, I generally try to direct people in the, in the direction of testing against uh, staging. Uh, there's a lot of advantages to this. Uh, the main ones are that if it falls over, it doesn't affect, you know, production customers. Uh, there's no PII, hopefully, on it. Um, and, you know, you can use things like uh, test credit cards that you can't normally use on production. So there's a lot of benefits to testing against staging if you can set that up for researchers. Um, but whatever you do, and, and we have this, this tweet from Pokemon Go, um, you know, make sure that it can stand up to testing. Uh, more than a few times, uh, you know, applications have gone down uh, because researchers are testing. Like, understand that researchers are going to throw hundreds and thousands of requests at this application. You know, they're going to use repeater, they're going to use intruder, they're going to use scanners. Uh, make sure that your application can stand up to this because the, the, the reason why this is important, aside from it just not falling over and causing other problems, is that as a researcher, if, you're, if you go to test on an application and the application's down, um, odds are you may not come back, or if, if the application is really slow, again, like how much time are you really going to spend investing on that application? I'll go just go test something else. There's a ton of other bounty programs out there, and you want researchers to be testing on yours. Uh, so make sure it can stand up to testing. Uh, other things to consider in this vein are contact forms. Uh, so uh, this has happened more than once. Uh, often your contact forms go to your sales or marketing teams. Uh, so if a researcher starts aggressively testing your contact form, is that going to generate a ton of emails to them and possibly create some noise? Again, another advantage to testing on staging uh, because, again, you can have those forms go to nowhere. But that's something to take into consideration. You know, if, if the researcher's testing on a certain functionality might break something for another department, that's something to take into consideration. Um, also, make sure you file your pen testing requests uh, with AWS or Heroku or whoever you're using. And also in line with that, make sure the rest of your security operations team, kind of like we talked about earlier, is on board with this. So they're not getting woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning thinking they're actually being attacked by uh, you know, researchers. Uh, another thing to note in regards to environment uh, is that it's not, while, we, while most bug bounty programs that you know, are publicly visible to most people, you know, say uh, you, know, you go to bugcrowd.com forward slash programs, most of those bu bu bounty programs are uh, web applications. Uh, but it's not, to, running a bug bounty is no longer limited to just testing a web application. You can do all, we've had success running against, um, what we'll do is we'll send out like IoT devices to researchers and they can test on those physically. Um, we've also done, you know, network type tests. Uh, another thing that's really fun for researchers to do is a CTF type thing. So there's a, there's a single objective. If you can own this box or if you can own this um, or retrieve this flag, then you get a lump sum. And it's a really you know, clear-cut objective and researchers just go for that. And there's a lot of different ways that you can use bug bounty programs now. Uh, so it's not just limited to testing against web applications. Uh, and then I want to talk briefly about uh, researcher environments. Um, this is what a shared researcher environment looks like. Uh, I don't know if that Oops. Um, shows quite well, but it's a train wreck out the top floor of a building. Um, it's generally not a great thing when you have, you know, uh, 50 researchers all testing in the same environment. Often it's something like a, a CMS or an admin portal or something like that. Uh, you can kind of imagine what happens. Uh, everybody's tripping over each other's payloads. Uh, you know, there's endless prompt boxes. Uh, somebody starts deleting other users. And again, none of this is necessarily nefarious. Um, but it's something to take into consideration um, when setting up, you know, your, your environment for researchers to test again. Uh, try, segregating accounts uh, for researchers is usually far more beneficial uh, in terms of getting um, researchers. So if you're the researcher, you're, as, as soon as you start running into those, it doesn't create a great environment for you to test on. And again, we want researchers to have a good environment to test on. Uh, so that's the reason why the environment is important. Which kind of takes us in to the idea of access. So how are researchers going to access this environment? Uh, and the bottom line is easier equals better. Uh, this is something that we kind of touched on earlier and touched on just a moment ago. Um, you want researchers to be testing on your application. And so we want to make it easier for re researchers to test on our applications. So this means providing them with the adequate resources to be successful on your program. Um, you know, some people sort of adopt a, a sort of like completely black box perspective on, you know, testing. Hey, you know, we'll give you no information and see what you can do. 
Um, you know, again, that, that may be what you're trying to do and, and you may get results from that, but ultimately the, the greatest results are going to come from when you give the researchers as much as possible uh, to be successful on the program. And because when they're successful on your program, you, that's a successful bug bounty program for you. Uh, so give them things like, you know, test credit cards, social security numbers, uh, phone numbers, et cetera. And a really good way to, to, to evaluate, you know, how you're building this is take a step back and say, hey, what I want to test on this. Like if I know nothing else about my application, um, if I'm just somebody and you, you put this in front of me and you say, hey, you can test against this, is that something that you would actively want to go test against? And if the answer is ever no, uh, then you should probably do, uh, you know, try to make it more enticing to researchers because again, we want researchers to be testing on our application. Um, finally, um, it's kind of in line with what I was talking about with the environment. We don't really want to share credentials. Um, it may be tempting to just set one set of credentials up and be like, hey, all the researchers can log in and use this. Um, but you can guess what probably happens there. The first guy logs in, he changes the password, and nobody else can access anything. Uh, and again, if you're that researcher that can't access anything, you're probably going to go test somewhere else. And uh, you, again, you want researchers to be testing on your application, which takes us back to the core idea of all this, is that it's you and researchers. You know, uh, Working with the researchers will get you exponentially better results in creating a successful bug bounty program than working against them. So you want to work with the researchers. Thanks, Grant. So, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the post-launch concerns. Uh, of course, the pre-launch stuff is extremely important. Something like creating a bounty brief, you want this to be really, really good before you actually launch. Uh, most importantly, you're gonna, you want to match your expectations. Post-launch is all about managing expectations. Uh, the researchers, they come in and they read your bounty brief, and especially experienced researchers, they actually know what to look for on bounty briefs. They'll look for types of exclusions that are maybe not often excluded. Certain vulnerability types that are pretty serious, but maybe for some uh, valid reason they are excluded. They look for these kinds of things, and this is what their conception of the bounty is. So uh, they have one expectation, and if they you know, make their first submission, which is their first point of communication with you, and you suddenly do something that's an out of line at the bounty brief, things will get very messy. So you can't avoid these messes. Uh, they do happen, and ultimately, the best way to do this is to kind of announce that you're going to pause your program, uh, collect the changes you actually need to make based on the you know few submissions that maybe where there were you know there were issues with them. Uh, announce you're going to restart the program at a certain time, and then you know just restart with the new changes and announce them. Uh, don't ever try and just kind of ninja make some changes and like you know we'll do it live. It's a bad idea. Um, if you do that, because you have so many people actually looking at your program, even if you have a, a, a private crowd and it's a small group of people and it's only 20 or 30 people, 20 or 30 people will absolutely notice your very minor changes. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Yeah, you, you know, things will happen, but you can deal with them. So this goes into communication. Uh, communication is one of the most important aspects of the bounty, and once you actually get submissions, you're going to have to start talking back and forth with researchers. Uh, so this process is something where, you know, it might seem in, a little bit intuitive, but it, it is very, very important to be concise and unambiguous. Um, a lot of researchers actually have English not as their first language. As I mentioned, we have re submitters from all over the world. So you want to make sure that you're just being very clear in your communication. Uh, researchers will ask questions about functionality. They'll ask questions about your bounty brief potentially. Just make sure that whatever you do, you're just giving them a straight answer. Don't ever try and give them some vague answer because, as Grant mentioned, you want to make sure it can't be misinterpreted. Uh, so in line with that, uh, additionally, you want to be pretty uh, quick and actually predictable with your response time and your reward time. So there's kind of a life cycle of a bug. When, when the researcher submits it, it goes in, and you have to have your kind of first touch, your first reply. And then at some point, it will be either you know, kind of marked as invalid or it will be marked as accepted. And then at some point, it will be paid if it's marked as accepted. So this process, the more predictable and the more transparent you are with the researcher, the better experience they're going to have and the better they're going to be able to allocate their own time in terms of they have a fixed number of hours to spend testing on bug bounties. And they want to make sure they can you know, roughly assess the value that they're going to get. So the more predictable you are, uh, the better it's going to be for researchers because they can know, okay, I'm going to spend you know, four hours doing this. I'm likely to you know, find some, this number of bugs, and this many will be valid, and it'll be this long until I'm uh, kind of bugs accepted and then eventually paid. So uh, keep that in mind because uh, pr predictability is very important. 
So yeah, stay on top of these issues. Uh, again, this is really a lot easier uh, to set all these policies and make sure you're prepared to do this before you even launch. Because um, fixing this stuff as you go can be trickier. Uh, but again, if, if you do find that you did let a bug sit for too long, uh, just you know deal with it and don't don't worry too much about it and just try to uh, improve that operational process. So public disclosure often comes up in the vein of communication, and obviously, I mean, this is a very common concern among people. They their, their thought is, well, if we go out to the, the world, as I mentioned earlier, and just tell people to hack us, well, like what happens if someone goes rogue, and what do we do? And they're gonna sell it to someone, and so, uh, you know, again, if you actually went to uh, Casey and Jim's talk yesterday, this is something that happens very, very rarely. Uh, and actually, while at BugCrowd, we do advise a default policy of non-disclosure. Uh, working to do a coordinated disclosure with a researcher can be extremely valuable for both you and them. So as an example here, we have a researcher, Stefano, who found a bug on Heroku. And this wasn't a trivial bug. Uh, you can go, you know, look at this blog post and read it. It's kind of cool. Uh, and this was account takeover. And as you can see here, uh, Stefano said, uh, this is the first bug I am actually proud of finding. So this is the kind of thing where, you know, researchers love this. Uh, they like the rewards, of course. But this kind of attention is great for their resume, and it's great for all kinds of things. Uh, so this was actually on, on Hacker News. It went to the front page, and it was really great. And uh, counterintuitively, it was actually very good press for Heroku because it showed how efficiently uh, they handled this bug. Uh, they got it. They, you know, they, you know, communicated the first time pretty quickly. They fixed the issue. Uh, they worked with the researcher on a timeline. They, you know, let the researcher let them review the blog post, and this worked really well. And this actually resulted in some benefits for Heroku, where people go, "Okay, wow, these these guys are fast and they're efficient and they're professional. I want to work on that program because it's it's going to be good for me. This is going to be better than working on a program that is not quite as efficient." So when it comes to actually understanding how a bug bounty program affects your security posture as an organization, uh, the best way we found to do that is to create a vulnerability rating taxonomy. So this is basically a simple document that maps vulnerability classes to certain priorities. So uh, we created kind of a one-size-fits-all one. We use the base for most of our programs, but we actually you know, suggest that you create your own, and we actually modify ours for individual clients because Every person is different. Every company has different needs. They are in different industries. Uh, certain vulnerabilities are more or less severe. But keeping track of this is going to do a lot of things for you. It's going to actually let you speed up your process to triage. Because if you've seen something four or five times and you know it's ra you know, rated at this severity, at least technically speaking, you can then use that as a benchmark for any time you see it in the future. And it results in uh, just more consistent ratings, which is a better experience for the researcher. Uh, of course, this is going to let you track your organization's security posture. So as you see more and more vulnerabilities, you're going to get to classify. You're going to start to add fewer and fewer things because you've seen so many. Uh, but that said, and on a regular basis, you should be going through this and deciding, well, is this actually still kind of a, a high vulnerability? Or maybe it's critical now. And why might that change? Well, you could implement some kind of protection that does something you know, in order to mitigate a whole class of vulnerabilities. Um, for example, Facebook has something they call the link shim, and the link shim is something that helps pr prevent leakage as a result of open redirects. So they don't really care as much about open redirects, and as a result, if they can find, if you can find a bypass of this system that's meant to mitigate this class of vulnerabilities, that might be more valuable. So uh, keep those things in mind as you're constantly reviewing this document and making changes to it as you go. Now, you can publish this, and researchers will be very happy if you do, because it's another level of setting expectations. This is going to be something they use to actually decide, well, what do I focus on? What's going to be treated as a critical vulnerability that's going to get me that top payout? And also, conversely, what's the, the stuff that's going to be paid $0? Um, so these are the kinds of things that researchers look for. And if you put this out there, you'll find that you'll get fewer reports that are kind of $0 accepted risks. And you might end up getting more reports that are higher severity, because if you're calling those things out, researchers will allocate their time there. Uh, all in all, though, this really just does help build trust. And that goes back to making sure that in the giant sea of bug bounty programs that exist today, uh, you have researchers coming back and testing on yours because you've built this relationship of trust with them. So I really want to talk about uh, some of the things that you can do as a program owner that are actually kind of thinking like a researcher. Uh, so there are all kinds of things that researchers do that could be valuable for you during the setup process or potentially even during the bounty. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are a ton of regular methodologies, uh, stuff like the Web Application Hacker's Handbook or the OWASP Testing Guide. And these are these you know, formulaic ways to go about actually approaching uh, the, the long process of actually formally testing an application. Researchers do actually think about these things. And as I mentioned, they end up just focusing on individual aspects of these things. Uh, but altogether, they do cover quite a lot. 
Uh, so some of these things that will be helpful, and I'm just going to go very briefly through some of these things. Uh, this, by the way, is some, some content from uh, Jason Haddix, who's our head of trust and security. He gave a talk at DEF CON a couple of years ago about uh, kind of the bug hunters methodology and a lot of tools and techniques that bug hunters use to, to do their work. So in, in understanding your attack surface, as Grant, talks, Grant talked about earlier, some of the things you're going to want to do are identify some of the roads less traveled. And researchers are very, very good at this. So stuff like acquisitions. Uh, you might realize that some acquisition of yours uh, doesn't have quite a mature security organization by the time you acquire it. And if they're going to be integrated with your team, how does that affect your bug bounty? You should come up with a policy that explicitly says when acquisitions go into scope, uh, or otherwise say they are not in scope unless we explicitly say so. So some companies are more aggressive than others. Uh, Google has a six-month policy, I believe, from an acquisition to going in scope. Uh, and you better believe that bug bounty hunters will set timers for exactly six months, and you will get reports on that um, if, it's, if it goes into scope in that way. Uh, other kinds of functionality changes or redesigns, stuff uh, like obscure platforms, uh, mobile websites, or uh, other kind of devices, all these kinds of areas are usually less looked at than web applications and are more likely to have bugs just because the code is not reviewed quite as much. So keep these things in mind, and as you're just defining your own scope, uh, actually take that into consideration when you do decide to do things like create incentives for certain targets and so on. Uh, some specific tools. Uh, I like Wikipedia for acquisitions. They actually just have lots of concise lists of uh, every acquisition by some of the larger companies with a lot of in interesting details, exact dates, uh, individual people involved, and these can be very helpful. Uh, for subdomains, this is a really big area, especially if you decide to go with kind of a star dot scope program. You might leave certain things out of scope, uh, but if you're going to do that, you should really consider running some of these tools that researchers actually use to enumerate targets, because you're going to want to leave some things out of scope if you find out that there's some interns project from four summers ago that has tons of vulnerabilities. You know, that's probably not something you want tested unless you're actually using it in production for some reason. So. Uh, stuff like uh, Google Dorks, Recon NG, Alt DNS, these are all great tools for subdomain enumeration. Uh, Jason Haddix, he created kind of a, a meta script that runs like all of these at once. Uh, pretty convenient, makes it a lot faster. But whatever you do choose to use, um, just do think like a researcher because uh, if you do have wider scopes, if you have some of these things undefined, you will get reports regarding the things that are undefined. So there's a lot more we can't really cover in this talk, uh, but I wanted to go through a little bit of it. and. Uh, next, very briefly, just wanted to show you an example of a, a good report. And the reason for this is that there are certain behaviors in reports that you're going to want to encourage, and they might be things that are a little bit counterintuitive. You can imagine that a really good report has lots of detail and it really dives down into something, but that's not always the case. Uh, so here, I have an example report. You probably can't read it because it's tiny and stretched and stuff, but uh, just if you can see the rough areas, basically uh, the biggest one is the title and the kind of the one sentence or two sentence description of the vulnerability. These are the first things that someone validating the vulnerability will look at and actually providing kind of the class, so in this case insecure direct object reference, and then what what is being accessed insecurely, it's multiple billing API endpoints. Well, that sounds pretty bad. And that's enough information so far for me to go, okay, I now have a rough idea of how bad this is going to be, I have a range. If you read the one-sentence description, you'll see that uh, he talks about just kind of changing an ID, and then you can see other customers' billing information just by having an account and being a customer. Well, that sounds really, really broken, and that does sound like an IDOR. So everything so far is very concise, and I actually already have a pretty good idea of what to expect. Now, the researcher also did provide an exact request and response. So this is something we often recommend asking for and making it kind of known that you really do want this information because with the request and response, you can often see what code path's being hit. You can see, uh, you can even reproduce it yourself. You can just replay the request with your own session information. Anything like that is all going to make it just much, much easier for you to understand what's going on, especially if the researcher themselves, um, let's say, you know, doesn't speak English as well and they, you know, they can't explain themselves as well. And then finally, uh, there are a set of number reproduction steps. So this is the other really huge one that we often uh, ask researchers to do is make sure that you, you order your steps and you break them down into concise bits that we can try and reproduce. That way, if we get stuck, we can actually know exactly what point we got stuck and ask for elaboration on something very, very specific. So when I get a report like this, even though it's not that full of a report, I mean, it's not tons of details and tons of other information, I actually pretty much have enough information to validate this. So... Uh, keep this in mind. Uh, the best reports are not always the most verbose or the most detailed or the most complex, uh, but just simple and including, um, you know, especially request information and steps are just very, very valuable. Now, you will ultimately get reports that are not nearly this concise. Uh, you will get reports for 
things like clickjacking, and even if it's something that's, uh, that's not fully excluded, maybe it's only uh, for sensitive actions and you're not sure if the action's sensitive, um, you might be kind of inclined to jump the gun and go, oh, I've seen like six of these reports and I don't want, you know, this is not good and recopied and pasted it or something. But keep in mind that a lot of these people are actually learning, and we've found that actually conveying what's going on and making sure that the researcher understands very specifically why the report is not valid is a very, it goes a very, very long way in actually having them not submit that stuff in the future. Um, the number of times I've actually explained how session management works in a basic web application to someone and had them go, oh, okay, that's, that's great, thanks, and then never seen them report that again across any program is more than you'd expect. So uh, keep in mind that these are, you know, researchers that are any level of experience they could be learning. Uh, so don't be too, you know, terse with them. Try and uh, work with them on this stuff. And even if the report seems like it might be copied and pasted, you know, give them a chance. Uh, don't kind of just discard anything. So I'm going to give it over to Grant to talk about some final tips. All right. Uh, so we, we've covered a lot of information uh, so far. Um, and so we just want to touch on a few uh, ideas really quickly as we close out. Um, so the first is, I consider the business impact. So there's there's the technical impact of, of vulnerability, like SQL injection, right? So, but that same SQL injection vulnerability has different business impacts if it's, you know, on a production server or if it's on, you know, again, some intern server that, you know, you didn't even know existed. Uh, same vulnerability, uh, different business impacts. So conveying this also to researchers can be helpful. Um, so, you know, certain targets may have uh, and this sort of goes back to, you know, when we were talking about focus areas, certain targets may have a, uh, a greater business impact associated with vulnerabilities. So you might want to attach rewards to that uh, so that researchers have that sort of expectation. And another thing to remember, uh, sort of what we touched on earlier, um, remember that the person on the other end of the keyboard is ultimately a person. Um, if you if you work with them, uh, most people are understanding and they get it like Dan talked about like when you work with researchers That's when you really get you know value Be, that guy that you go back to and you say hey uh, You explain session management to him, you know He may not be an, an elite researcher at that moment, but he's far more likely to come back and test on your application uh, As opposed to like if you if you you know shut him down and said, oh, this is garbage Please never submit again. That's just you know, that's not uh, that's not great for getting researchers to come back. And also the researcher community is, is uh, fairly tight knit in terms of, you know, people share their experiences. So uh, just treat everybody. And I mean, this goes back to the golden rule of like life, you know, just treat people like people. Uh, but it's a good thing to remember because it can be forgotten a lot of times behind a keyboard. Um, finally, the link broke. <laughs> the link's broken. Oh, the link's broken. <laughs> yeah, they pulled our link into the middle of the thing. That's weird. Um, all right, so finally, I want to leave you guys on a, a sort of high note here with a, with a case study. Uh, this is Canvas by Instructure. They do learning, mo learning management software. And they do something that's really cool. They, they post all their yearly pen test reports on their website. So that link that's in the middle of our chart, um, you can go there. And you can, you can actually, you know, download these reports and see the vulnerabilities. Uh, and that, that's great. I mean, I, I think that's really cool. Um, but what we can get from that is what we can see is that in 2013, they ran a, a pen test and they got one high finding, one medium, and two low. Uh, the subsequent year, uh, in 2014, they ran a, a two-week uh, engagement with, with a bug bounty, uh, a two-week bug bounty with 25 researchers that sort of mimics the whole pen test idea. But instead of one or two pen testers, you have 25 researchers. Uh, and these 25 researchers came up with 25 high findings uh, eight medium and 16 low. And this is the exact same application. Um, so this really just shows what Dan talked about earlier is, is the, the real value of crowdsource testing is that you have all these different eyes. You know, if, if you've done, done any testing yourself, you know that you'll find things other people missed and other people will find things that you missed. Uh, and so by having more eyes on the application, we can find more things. Um, and then we also included 2015 on here. Uh, which, you know, obviously the numbers are substantially diminished, but this is again still the same application, uh, you know, and, and just again, 25 researchers over the course of two weeks, they're still finding more things. Um, so again, there's, you can continue to get bug bounty programs even a year later uh, against the same application or value out of the bug bounty program a year later. Um, so in short... So uh, kind of to summarize a lot of this, 
basically, bug bounties are super effective. And we don't necessarily recommend that bug bounties should be a replacement for penetration testing. Uh, they can be used as a great complement to this. So it is a different type of testing, but you will get very interesting results because you have that level of diversity. Uh, and this is something that is achievable. As long as you have this uh, foresight to think when you're creating your bounty brief, what am I expecting? What do I want to see? And understand the researchers will use that to set their expectations. Uh, you're going to have a really smooth time and you're going to get great results. So that's it. Thanks. software company that it's B2B, so I'm having a hard time convincing anybody that letting a thousand researchers log into our relatively small like user base, and they're high paying, but there's only like a hundred users maybe. Um, so I'm having a hard time convincing people that that's the right idea because there's this wall of we have to log in and be a customer. So how do you address that uh, when you're going about doing bug bounty? So, yeah, so I mean, there are certain applications that have, uh, you know, that are, that are used by businesses or they're used by uh, people who already have some level of access potentially. So, of course, in a scenario like this, it, it's great if you can spin up some kind of staging server. That's a separate instance that lets you have a whole bunch of these uh, researchers act as businesses that are, lo that are logging in. Um, that's ideal. Uh, running that kind of thing in production, probably not the greatest idea for that specific case, unless there's a way you can do some form of segregation, in which case we've seen cases like that. You have multi-tenant applications where you can set up like a separate kind of organization within the application and then have that be like the researcher's organization. Um, so that's a great way to do it. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of things you can do just to think about, okay, what, what is the environment we're going to test with and how can we do this in a way where we're just not going to cause any problems? But we have te certainly tested on all kinds of uh, B2B applications where there is definitely some level of privilege required. And then when it comes to validating the submissions, you also, you also consider the threat model. So, uh, you know, you, the threat model is you are a business who has access to this and that's, you know, kind of where you start your uh, business impact rating. I mean, in the end, if you get really good results, I'm happy, right? What if you get, you know, pretty uh, average results or, you know, pretty poor results? How can, how can I know that you've done the, you know, what is the researchers have done the job? Cool, yeah. So the question is, how can we, uh, you know, ensure that we're getting good results or uh, basically, you know, if the results aren't so good, what do we do? Um, so there's all kinds of tools you can use to do this. Uh, we basically, I mean, if you're, running, if you're running a bounty and we're managing it, then we're kind of, we're, we're looking at all the submissions and only passing valid stuff to you that's already rated at a priority level. But if you're managing it yourself too, um, even if you have someone else who's doing that kind of first level and they're passing along certain things to you, uh, maybe you're not getting enough submissions. And in that case, we would look at adjusting the bounty. So we'd look at your bounty brief and say, Maybe your scope is really, really narrow, or maybe it's not even that narrow, but it's actually the way it's conveyed is just kind of ambiguous and it could be made more clear so it's clear that it's not as narrow as researchers think it is. Uh, so we'll, we'll ask questions like that. We'll get researchers feedback. Uh, maybe the rewards can be changed. So we've had, I've, I remember cases where we had a reward range that was, you know, pretty conservative, kind of what we start off at, which is usually 100 to 1500. And we weren't getting money results, but we increased the top reward to 5,000, and suddenly there were lots of submissions. So uh, researchers kind of have to make this cost-benefit decision, and some of them maybe won't test if the top reward isn't high enough, but we can always adjust those variables to make sure that we're getting better results. Uh, in terms of time range, I believe they were both two-week engagements. Uh, regarding the other specifics on the pen test, I don't actually have that information. Uh, but you can go download the actual pen test report. Like, it's from the company that they use. Um, so I imagine that you should be able to gain uh, a lot of that information from that report. Uh, I don't know the, the exact cost of it uh, or any of those other specifics, but I, I'd imagine that you should be able to get a lot of that information from that report. 
Uh, no, I mean, we, we have researchers who have very diverse backgrounds. I mentioned, I mean, a lot of them are sort of like in the 18 to 29 range, um, but we have people who are outside of that range. Uh, there's different levels of experience. Um, we usually refer to them as researchers or bug bounty hunters, but um, they, they have all different you know, levels of experience, even within bug bounties themselves. Uh, we keep track of stuff like how accurate they are, you know, so you can see like how many submissions are going to be valid versus invalid for individual people. Um, they have, you know, they can create profiles and stuff like that. So there's some level of like measurement of their performance within um, at least our ecosystem and other people have their own ecosystem and stuff like that. But yeah, these really are just people. And um, some of our people are, you know, we have elite people who are just really, really amazing at what they do. Um, we have people who are also really, really strong uh, in that we invite to private programs, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the answer is really they are just everyone. Um, there's, no, there's no necessary uh, boundary between like we only looking at AppSec people or something like that. No, well, we would pick people based on this, the skills required. So if you're going to test like a mobile application, we're going to pick people that we know are good at testing mobile applications. Uh, so we make that, we have an entire team of people who is very, very good at understanding exactly what people are good at and when we should and shouldn't use them. So just depending on what you, you want your bounty to be, that's, that's how you make that decision. And that's kind of how you should make that decision in terms of who to attract. If you're running your own bounty and you want to test a mobile application, you should be looking for people who, who are good at that specifically. Anything else? All right, uh, thanks for coming.